record. Hello and welcome to this Ranger 4 webcast. Today's webcast will be looking at the Ranger 4 liftoff workshop. Today's webcast will be brought to you by Helen Bill, the head of DevOps here at Ranger 4. If you have any questions, just enter them into the chat and we'll answer them at the end. So now I'll pass you over to Helen. Thanks, Ted, and hello, everybody, and welcome to today's workshop. As Ted said, today we're going to be talking about the Ranger 4 DevOps liftoff workshop, and I'm Helen Beal, the head of DevOps here at Ranger 4. The DevOps liftoff workshop um, is a one-day piece of consultancy. It's free, and it's intended to give you some practical advice and some real-world examples on how to start a DevOps project. Um, I said it's one day. We tend to run it from 10 to 4, and we can run it on your site if you're based in the UK we can run it out of our main office in Weybridge in Surrey or we have a couple of partner sites in the Royal Exchange in the City of London or um, up in Warwick alternatively that would suit better if you're not based in the UK but would like um, to do a remote workshop we can do that over go to meeting as well we tend to do um, a cut down version of about three hours as it's a little bit difficult to spend kind of too long on online together um, it's a very interactive workshop. It's effectively a series of exercises, as you'll see in a moment. Um, we recommend that you um, identify between four and 12 staff members that you'd like to attend uh, the workshop. And they can be a mixture of disciplines. So we'd recommend that you have some people from IT and uh, development and Sorry, IT operations. Sorry, Helen. Yes? I just can't see the presentation at the moment. Sorry oh, to interrupt you. No worries. We, um try that again yeah there you go thank you for that sorry everybody um, so yeah as I was saying four to twelve people from different disciplines so some people from your IT development part of your organization some from IT operations uh, but you may also want some people from other parts of your IT organization perhaps some people from your support desk um, or your IT security people, DBAs, architects, or um, many organizations also like to bring along uh, some line of business people to get involved also. So there are three high level objectives of the, um, of the workshop. First of all, we want to help people identify where they are on, a, on the maturity scale for DevOps. So identify their current state and then start looking at a future state and having a vision of where they want to be. And then the third objective is to, to really join those two things together and figure out how to get from where you are now to where you want to be by developing a DevOps roadmap. This is um, the, the, the agenda from the workshop. As I said, you can see it's essentially a series of exercises and you'll see that the exercises vary in length from about 20 minutes to about 40 minutes long. So it's a really quite an intense day. There's a lot to get done. So we need to work really hard with you to keep focused on each task in hand and make sure we complete it and move on to the next one. Um, you'll see there's some tasks in there like write business cases and developing roadmaps. So we do as much as we can in the, in the time available, but some of these are quite high level in terms of where we end up with. But let's have a look at the exercises, each of them in a little bit more detail. So the first exercise that we begin with is the defining DevOps exercise. This is um, an exercise for the whole group, a flip chart based exercise, and it's really kind of a warm up exercise for so getting people talking and interacting. So we'll ask the two or three members of the group to contribute their definitions of DevOps and we'll, we'll mark them up on the, the flip chart. And then we'll compare and contrast people's ideas of what DevOps is, is about with each other's, but also with some um, definitions from the experts in the field of DevOps. The aim of this exercise is to have a, an agreed definition for this particular organization, your organization, of what DevOps means to you. The second exercise of the morning that we move into is around baselining. Anyone that um, has a level of familiarity with DevOps and has understood or heard the acronym CAMS from John Willis will know that the M in CAMS stands for metrics, the others being culture, automation and sharing. And some people may be more familiar with the term CAMS, which some people also use and the L in CAMS is for lean. But the metrics element of DevOps is absolutely essential and it en enables us to do a couple of things. And the first is it provides the basis of a business case so we can start identifying the metrics that we're going to measure and start putting values against them and start developing a return on investment case. And the other piece of what it enables us to do is 
once we know where we're starting from and where we're going, we can then report on our progress as we get um, to our ultimate goals and reward on success that way as well. So the way that we um, run this exercise is we have some range of four metrics matrices that um, we provide to the group. And at this point, we split um, the group into smaller teams. So depending on how many are in the total group, there might be um, two or three teams of four, for example. The metrics tables are quite tightly focused on some very core um, metrics for DevOps. And the, the DevOps Liftoff Workshop is um, a small piece of consultancy based on a, a bigger piece of consultancy that we offer the DevOps Maturity Assessment, which is about 10 days. And when we do the full DevOps Maturity Assessment, we also use something called the Range of Four DevOps Maturity Index. And within that, we measure across a number of cultural and process-based attributes um, in addition um, to these very tight DevOps matrix uh, measurements that we use here. But because this is a one day workshop and this is a 30 minute exercise, we do focus back um, just on these these core metrics. And they're things like the volume and frequency of release and the elapsed time to release, the volume and frequency of defects, uh, the time to fix the defects, volume and frequency of outages and MTTR, so your mean time to response or resolution. So we get um, the teams to complete these matrices and then um, we pull the teams back together as a group and we have a look at um, the numbers and this is normally quite an interesting piece and you know, there's two main bits here one is you know whether those numbers are in people's heads and how accurate they are where we can get that kind of information from and also how the group's numbers compare to each other so does one group think that there's a nine week um, defect resolution or, or test cycle test cycle and does some, some other group think it's actually more like three weeks when we're back together as a group, we can look at this DevOps maturity scale that we use here and start trying to identify which position from one to five um, the organization sits on based on kind of the general feeling of what we've learned so far and what we think about the metrics that we're starting to pull together. The next exercise, the third one of the morning, um, is about visualizing the future state. So we remain in the, the groups, or we go back into the groups that we just established at this point, and each group uses a number of keywords that we provide um, to identify which keywords they feel strongly about, strongly positively or strongly negatively, and start introducing their own keywords into what they think um, their future state would look like or how they would describe that future state. And, and once we have the keywords, we start building that out into a vision statement. The next piece we move on to is writing a business case. And again, we remain in the, the specific groups at this point. We use uh, the range for DevOps uh, business case template. So this is a 40 minute exercise, which I'm sure everyone will appreciate is not a very long time to be building a business case. So hence the it, using the template. And the template gives some guidance um, on how to use the metrics that we've identified earlier, how to use the desired visual future state and how to uh, make some calculations off the back of that, the kind of thing that finance directors are going to want to see when they're approving DevOps projects. Once we've completed those exercises, we get together um, back as a group and we have a look at the business case together and, and see um, what commonalities there are within the group's thinking and what um, the direction we think that draft business case will go in through the rest of the course of the day and beyond. And we break for lunch for an hour um, during lunch. We hope that people are reflecting on what we've been doing on in the morning, but also thinking about um, what we're going to be doing in the afternoon and have the agenda so you'll know um, some of what's coming next. So the first exercise of the afternoon is about setting goals. Um, and here we um, are looking very much at SMART goals. So we have SMART goal templates that we use. So here's an example of a DevOps SMART goal template, and you'll see um, those of you familiar with SMART goals, I'm sure pretty much everyone on the call is, you'll see that this, this is very specific. There are measurable elements to it. Um, there's attainability stated within it. It's relevant to what the business goal is doing and there's some time elements to it as well. So this DevOps goal, our team will release updates to the core business application Milton once a day by the 1st of September 2014. We currently perform releases once a fortnight, but believe using automation, this goal is attainable. Not only will it allow us to put revenue generating innovation to market faster, the process will be more consistent and reliable. So what I forgot to mention a moment ago is after lunch, we for this exercise, we do split back up into teams. But what we'll do is we'll mix the teams up. So you'll have different team members during the course of the afternoon exercises. And with this team, you'll be um, 
developing two or three of these goals. Here's another example of one that we commonly use um, within to drive thinking and in, inspire thought processes during the, the workshop. So we, the testing team, will reduce the volume of defects from 20 to 2 per week by the end of 2014. And through improved testing techniques, reduce the average time to fix a defect from four hours to 30 minutes in the same time frame, thus removing backlog and pushing software improvements to market at greater velocity. We like using this example because it generates quite a lot of debate because um, the testing team in this SMART goal are responsible for the volume of defects, which isn't actually naturally how it would normally happen because the volume of defects would tend to come through from the development team. So the testing team's influence over the volume should actually be quite small. Um, this particular SMART goal has the potential to drive the wrong sort of behaviours. Um, you know, God forbid, the testing team might start hiding some defects in order to hit their goals and that sort of thing. So. This is an interesting topic for debate. Once we've been talking about goals, we naturally um, end up thinking about what happens if you hit a goal and what the consequences are of that. And hopefully there'll be positive consequences and be um, resulting in, in good feeling within the team and potentially some kind of reward. And we do a lot of work with organisations talking about how to reward people, how um, extrinsic and intrinsic rewards work. And this particular piece of neuroscience SCARF um, we've been using a lot to try and help people understand what motivates them. So the neuroscience behind SCARF basically talks about um, social motivations and behaviours and the fact that we have brain circuitry that is um, developed that gives us a threat and reward response. And that brain circuitry that um, is used for kind of life um, affirming decisions so you know the basic needs around shelter and having threats on your life made is the same brain circuitry that's used um, at work during um, exercises that enable you to feel rewarded and motivated so the principle behind SCARF says um, that every one of us is influenced or has a primary motivation or driver of one of these five areas this is from Dave Locke's book The Brain at Work so the five primary motivational drivers defined in SCARF are status for S, so that is about um, knowing your professional place at work and feeling proud of it and feeling that you, you're achieving what you want to achieve and getting to the level that you want to be at and getting the, the mastery or the SME or the subject matter expert or thought leadership that's important to you. Um, the C is around certainty, so the, the people that like to have lots of security at work, um, knowing that what the future holds, knowing what the outcome of the situation is likely to be. The people that value autonomy are the kind of people that like to know that their input or their contribution to work has a measurable or tangible outcome and that they are given the creative freedom to make decisions um, on their own and, and create projects and deliver things um, of their own volition. The R is for relatedness, so this is um, the people that really enjoy feeling that they're working part of a team of very like-minded people, almost the concept of kind of the family at work, the confidence that everyone is on the same team and working towards the same goals. And the F is around fairness, so these are the people that are very concerned about openness and transparency at work and uh, the feeling that everyone is being treated equitably. So the importance of understanding um, these motivational drivers is basically when a threat is made, if you're somebody that likes certainty and you're made to feel insecure and a threat against your security at work, you will have um, a, a neurological response similar to a threat on your life. And similarly, if you're rewarded, you'll have um, the oxytocin and, and dopamine type um, responses that you would expect from other areas of your life to be rewarded. So it's very important to kind of understand your own motivations because that helps you understand your reaction to certain situations at work and perhaps um, influence the way that you behave if you feel that you could um, perhaps not react so stressfully or that you um, maybe would like to be able to debate and not feel under so much confrontation that sort of thing similarly if you understand yourself under the scarf um, neuroscience you have a better chance of understanding your colleagues and similarly um, why you might react differently in certain situations and how you can help each other to get to the same place of where you want to be. So the uh, the next exercise, the sixth exercise, is around self-assessment. So um, we use an online SCARF self-assessment tool. And we, we ask everyone before we start the online self-assessment to try and, and think about whether which of the SCARF attributes they think they are most like, or one or two. Some people um, sort of have a major and minor. And then we ask everyone to complete the self-assessment online individually and then we compare the results and 
have a chat about people whether people think that was um, actually relevant to them. So once we've um, talked <clears throat> or done these exercises up to here, so we've kind of got an idea of um, where we are, where we want to be, the kind of metrics we can use to measure, the kind of goals that we're aiming for, and the kind of things that are going to help us get there and, and keep on going. Um, we start having a chat about flow and the theory of, theory of constraints. So for anybody that's read um, either the goal or the Phoenix Project by Gene Kim and uh, George Spafford and Kevin Beer um, will know about uh, the theory of constraints and its history um, in Kanban, the um, manufacturing process improvement methodology that came out of Toyota that has um, subsequently been applied to software development very successfully. So the theory of constraints says that any improvement made uh, um, that's made that is not a bottleneck is just an illusion. So the theory is that if you um, just change flow around a bottleneck, but just don't remove the bottleneck, all you're doing is increasing and decreasing flow at either side of that bottleneck and not um, influencing the outcome. So in the next exercise, exercise seven, um, we play a game called Feature Ban. Uh, Feature Ban um, is a Creative Commons licensed by a gentleman called Mike Burrows, who is a Kanban expert. Um, again, we're in our teams at this point, so we have a four column board and a number of stickers. And we do some exercises where we start creating features and try to move them through the work stages and do practicing blocking and moving different um, features and doing things like feedback loops and testing out um, the principles of Kanban and um, increasing flow through the logistical system. Once we've done that, we move on to um, the last but one exercise, number eight, where we look at building a software manufacturing pipeline. So this is where we're considering the DevOps tool chain. So this is a whiteboard exercise for the whole group. Um, and what we do is we provide you with um, various objects that you can stick to the board that represent components of the DevOps tool chain, right from requirements identification and gathering and and management through and um, development change and defect management pieces um, into testing and build and deployment and beyond into um, performance management. We start building up um, a graphical representation on the board of what your tool chain in your pipeline looks like today. And we'll take a, a snapshot basic picture of that and then start building on that some more, thinking about what we've learned already, where there's areas of improvement that you've identified when you've looked at your metrics where there's bottlenecks that you thought about when we've been thinking about Flow and Kanban and start building what um, a future DevOps pipeline might look like. So this is a, a big automation piece of the day's exercises. The final exercise of the day, number nine, is designed to bring everything together that we've been doing um, through the day. So we've talked about baselining, we've talked about establishing future state, and we've had some um, discussions around flow and building pipelines and looking at improvement metrics. So the next thing we'll try and do is bring that all together and start building a high level roadmap of how to get from where you are today to where you want to be tomorrow. So this is a, an example of a potential roadmap and um, what you'll see is the baseline and the vision on the left and then you'll see that we have a number of initiatives and imperatives to consider. We need to fit, assess and prioritise ideas that we might have until we get to the point where we've got an approved project plan of a, a sequence or they could be done in parallel but of activities that will lead to the ultimate goal which often but not for everybody um, is continuous delivery so you can see there's a number of different types of projects that people might want to do here things around um, DevOps reorganization maybe some cultural change maybe some um, further analysis on specific processes in the application lifecycle or the software development lifecycle uh, moving through into potential um, automation and tools implementations so in summary, there's the nine exercises in the, the liftoff workshop. The first is the, for you to define DevOps. The second, to establish your baseline metrics that you'll build your business case and your goals from. The third, to visualize the future state, which will also be an important part of the business case and the goals. So we're just moving on to, to those two bits in four and five. Um, in the sixth exercise, we'll do some work on understanding motivations and thinking about rewarding behaviors. Um, in the seventh exercise, we'll move on to flow and the theory of constraints and play the feature band game to get um, some hands on experience with Kanban. And in the eighth exercise, we'll start building out the DevOps tool chain. So having a look at what components you currently have in your tool chain and what pieces it would be possible to add um, in the future. 
And finally, we try and bring all that together and, and deliver you an action plan or a DevOps roadmap of things to take away. So kind of recapping from that, the deliverables of the, the Liftoff workshop, um, your vision statement of what your DevOps culture and environment would look like, <clears throat> the baseline metrics that enable you to know where you're starting from and measure your success moving forward, that enable you to build this very initial draft business case, so it's so a high level return on investment um, tool to take to your financial people, um, and then looking at defining these goals, specific goals that you can potentially run reward programs around, and then finally, your roadmap and your action plan to take you forward. So if you'd like um, to engage with us and request a DevOps a lift off workshop, then you can email us at hello at ranger4.com and those of you on the call today um, will get a link to a place where you can do that with us. And now I think we're moving into the questions and answers section. Um, Ted, I think we had some. Yeah, we've had a few emailed to us by someone who couldn't attend, Dennis, so I'll start off with those and if anyone thinks of any questions while I'm asking these, just feel free to write them in the chat box and I'll ask Helen when she's done. So the first one is, would Ranger 4 recommend Kanban as a process for discovering, planning and prioritising a DevOps implementation? So yes, and uh, Dennis sent me this um, question obviously before he'd seen the presentation, but as, as you've seen yourselves, um, one of the key exercises is around um, very much around Kanban. So the feature ban exercise is a game where we'll simulate um, a simple Kanban process. Uh, so absolutely, you know, it's heavily referenced in the Phoenix project. It's a very important part of understanding flow and understanding how to identify these bottlenecks. And if you're, you're doing a DevOps project, that's what we're really trying to do is identify bottleneck by bottleneck <clears throat> and take each one out until we have um, a very smooth end-to-end -end process for software development with um, a lot of automation within that. Next question. Okay, he says, in my experience, infrastructure and environment change, as well as build and CI change, is always an initial requirement to enable developers to write code to implement new features. I have found that at the planning stages, not enough time or resources is given to these initial tasks. What are range of force findings? Yeah, so... Um, I think Agile has been around for a long time and Agile was very much about development and things and now we've kind of got the operation side getting involved. We talk quite a lot about um, shifting left. In fact, when we, were, um, when we were looking at this earlier, we were looking at um, a potential uh, blog that I'd written here, which is about um, shifting, drifting left or right. So um, we talk about sh left shifting a lot um, at range four. We, we started talking about it actually because we do a lot of work with test automation and it's um, been shown um, there are very significant savings that can be achieved if you move the testing process to the left, i.e. identify and fix defects much earlier in the, in the cycle. Um, but we do talk much more now about shifting left in terms of bringing operations into the development process much earlier. So where we've had situations in the past where we see organizations where um, the operations teams can get frustrated with the feeling that they're shown new code changes very late in the cycle and they're expected to get them live very quickly when actually they're very busy with the backlog of work and potentially um, some unplanned work if there's been some system failures. Um, by involving operations much earlier in the development cycle, so shifting their process left, getting them involved, perhaps even in the requirements gathering stages, um, IT operations can then feel that they have um, a view of the work that's coming through in the pipeline. Similarly, the developers can start building in to their plans things that they know about the production environment and the requirements and imperatives and configuration um, needs of those environments so that everything becomes, becomes much more matched up. So yes, another good question from Dennis. Okay, he also writes, I understand that change comes from an idea or feature to be developed, but should DevOps have been called Ops Dev because of the reasons I mentioned above? Yeah, so Ted and I enjoyed this question when we, we reviewed it briefly earlier, and um, I think uh, Dennis is right. Um, Ted made the point, and I wasn't sure whether to say this, but we think that DevOps slips off the tongue a lot easier than Ops Dev, perhaps, but I think... Um, Traditionally, when we, we, we read from left to right and we see the, the application lifecycle from left to right, it is development moving into operations. So, and those are typically the kind of the two main silos within an IT organization. So, um, yeah, as I said earlier, you know, we've had agile around for developers for a long time. I think 
um, DevOps is, is, uh, has been described actually by some of our agile practitioners as um, DevOps is agile on steroids, so sort of extending agile out into the operations team. So perhaps, um, you know, perhaps it is more about ops and perhaps it should be more, um, have more emphasis in the, in the word, but I think DevOps is probably here to stay now. Okay, and finally, he asks, is the take-up of DevOps in Windows, VMware, Hyper-V environments the same as the take-up in Linux environments? So we um, are definitely seeing more um, DevOps activity in Linux, or I should probably specify actually Java environments more than in um, Windows and .NET environments. It's not to say we're not seeing any in .NET, but I think the general trends that way is that um, the Java applications and the or the Java-based, Linux-based environments that we see, those applications tend to be um, of a greater complexity and have more integrations and perhaps have a greater requirement um, for DevOps-type resolutions to problems around build versioning and configuration and deployment challenges. So, yes, I think that's what I would say there. Okay, that's all the questions for now. Thanks for that great presentation, Helen. I hope everyone enjoyed it. And thanks, everyone, for attending. Goodbye for now. Thanks, everyone.